Hi everybody, welcome to week four of ECE 103. This is our fourth and final week. I'm glad you're still here. Uh, we will continue on as usual into our fourth and final week. Um, and please know that of course this course will end Sunday at midnight and our next course will begin Monday. So the next day, We'll begin ECE 105, Curriculum and Development, where we'll learn a little more about uh, some different types of curriculum you might encounter in a daycare or in a learning center situation. So uh, keep your eyes on all of, all of your assignments. Uh, be sure to check in with our gradebook and let me know if you see any points missing. Uh, sometimes I'll have students that will have problems uploading an assignment to my course connection. So sometimes they'll send it to me uh, via email, which normally works, but occasionally those assignments can get a little lost in the email. So if you have turned something in, and you're not seeing points up for it, please be sure and contact me so we can figure it out. Okay, our student question of the week is, I'm getting ready to have a baby. Can I take time off for classes? And guys, over the last two years, I have had this happen several times with my students. I always enjoy my ECE babies. Uh, please know that we are a very um, mommy-friendly campus. We do have maternity leave. Um, most students can take, uh, they take about two class cycles off, so that would be about two months, um, to take care of that newborn and catch up on some sleep, um, because babies really don't sleep all the time, do they? <laughs> so some moms want to do this and some do not. It's completely up to you, but if you feel you need this, please know it's available. Uh, it depends on how much time you need, and of course all babies are different. So, hey, if you happen to have a baby on and you think you can do college and baby and you discover that it's a little too stressful, uh, you can uh, take that month or two off if needed, okay? You just need to be sure and communicate with us and let us know when you would like to start and end your maternity leave. And this generally works with financial aid as well. Have I mentioned the final project in earlier lectures? I think I have. You'll be putting together your newsletter, hopefully getting that um, all polished up this week. I won't go over the requirements for it because I think we've covered that in past lectures. However, I want you to know in the real world what you might do with this. So you might send this newsletter home in the student's folder. Some schools have a folder that goes home. You might have a copy of the newsletter in the pickup area at school or maybe right inside or outside your doorway on a little table. You might have a digital copy available on the school's website. You might post the newsletter to social media such as Facebook. Uh, and I think as you can see there's lots of different areas you could use it. Communication is so important and uh, sometimes putting together these newsletters is, is exactly what the parents need. So I hope you're getting a little experience with this project. You are so much more, remember this, to the world you may be a teacher, but to your students you are a star. You are amazing. Keep that in mind. Today we're going to go over uh, a little bit about six, seven, and eight-year-olds, kind of what to expect with these age groups, what they can do, and how they're developing. If we look at the developmental overview, six, seven, and eights um, experience a period of integration and reorganization. Their bodies are getting better, their minds are growing, they've got more information, and they have to sort of adjust as a whole. Uh, they enjoy school but may find it stressful at times and it's important that we realize that in our classroom and provide ways to de-stress when needed. They learn to respect family rules and routines as well as school rules and routines. They become a little more independent and it's important that we provide that for them. 
they began learning how to read, a big step. They continued to learn primarily through play. So six, seven, and eights still really need that recess time. Um, they make friends, they enjoy friendships, and with the seven and eights, we start to see a little friendship drama. We just have to be ready to handle it. So what do we learn through play, construct knowledge, problem solve, learn, internalize experiences, discover, laugh, have fun, speak, read, write, count, um, all of these come along as a result of play. So um, it's important that you know that and you can pass that along to the parents of the children in your classroom. Our six-year-olds now specifically Body shape becomes more adult-like. They go through a little growth spurt, and they go from this little kid body into kind of a stretched out body. So it's going to change their motor coordination, strength, and dexterity beginning a little bit better. And we want to do physical education exercises that emphasize this. Uh, they have a need to move about pretty frequently, so sitting down for a long period of time is not a good idea. Um, they're eager to try new challenges, begin to recognize words by sight. This is when it's great to have everything labeled in the classroom is during these years. Carry on understandable conversations. Like the little adults they are, use logic when playing games so they can play more complex games. And know right from wrong, but still need that adult guidance and approval in this aspect. So we don't just let them go. And when we talk about six-year-olds, the thing that comes to mind for me is this six-year-old smile. Uh, in kindergarten and in first grade, oh my goodness, when they get close to six, it just seems like that's when all the teeth start falling out. So it's not unusual for a kid to begin kindergarten with a full mouthful of teeth, and by the end, they're missing two or three. So the six-year-old smile. The seven-year-olds are generally healthy and energetic. They don't get sick as often. They demonstrate writing and drawing skills that are a little more refined and a little more detailed to them. They understand the consequences of their actions. They are articulate, able to create and describe um, stories. Great time for creative writing is with seven-year-olds. Um, enjoy friendships, play primarily with same-gender friends. And so the previous year, it may have been a mixed group of boys and girls. But um, in the seven- and eight-year-olds, we see them kind of split up and start playing with same-gender friends instead. So for our seven-year-olds, here's a great example of a seven-year-old classroom. They're goofy. They're creative. Um, they work with each other. And this looks like a typical classroom to me. A seven-year-old would be about second grade. You can see that they've still got a number line on their test. They've got their bottles of water, these hats that they've made, and they're so proud of their creations. Okay, lastly, our eight-year-olds. Eight-year-olds continue to grow. Girls may surpass boys in height. Uh, we, I'll show you a picture here in just a minute of the differences. Um, they devote an effort to improving their motor skills, both fine and gross motor skills. They have lots and lots of energy, enjoy individual and team sports because they're starting to um, be able to remember all the rules involved in a team sport. So this is when a team ball might come in or soccer. They develop uh, understanding and they start to develop empathy. And we want to foster that in our kids. We want them to understand or begin to be able to understand how another person feels. It's very important. Alternate between acting childish and watching independence too. So they kind of go back and forth. They enjoy planning and organizing activities. Give them that little bit of independence in, in doing the organization read with ease and understanding. So they're doing much better with their reading at this age level. Okay, back to the height difference. If you look at this third grade classroom, you're going to notice there's quite a few girls on the back row and on, on the second row as well. So these girls go through a bit of a growth spurt in uh, third grade, but don't worry, the boys will be catching up very soon. 
positive behavior guidance. Um, this would go for all age groups. Adults should always set a good example and exhibit self-control. Um, you are the example that they look up to. You're their hero. Be sure and be a good hero. Um, state rules in positive terms for the classroom and since uh, they're beginning to read in these age groups, of course you want to have them posted on the wall as well. It might be something that you go over um, every morning for the first few weeks of school so that they really get those down. Listen to children and acknowledge their feelings. Uh, realize uh, you wouldn't expect uh, an adult to just get over a feeling or a situation instantly. Realize that children need time to um, sort of wrap their heads around what feeling they're have, having, go through it, and then overcome it. So give them that time. Uh, teach problem solving, communication, conflict resolution, and anger management skills. They need to learn how to handle their anger, which is going to pop up from time to time. Ignore behaviors that are not likely to cause a problem. We know sometimes behaviors are attention seeking. Um, we need to maybe in that chance we ignore the behavior, but then we take a chance later on to give that attention when they're uh, exhibiting in a positive behavior. So we can go either way with that. And we are down to our last slide, guys. If you have any questions, be sure and contact me. I hope you have a fantastic week four. All right. Bye-bye.